Whoa. Hi. How many of you were here yesterday for our panel? Okay, so we can skip a lot of that, huh? Yeah? Well, let's do it this way. How many weren't here? Jeez, it's the same, you guys, same people. <laughs> it's been a long night. All right, well, he's getting his thing set up. Um, yesterday we did a brief intro, just basically what Man at Arms is, and, and it kind of ended up in just us answering a lot of questions, which is fine. Uh, today, feel free, just the same, to ask questions. Um, Ilya is going to get more in depth about some historical stuff. This is kind of his thing, so we're kind of just along for the ride. But uh, we can give a little brief intro of the show. Um, not going to give the whole history like I did yesterday, but for those of you who don't know, we film six episodes in about eight to nine filming days, depending on whether or not there's a sponsor or not. So if there's a few little minor details there that you don't get to see in your favorite piece, we do apologize. We would love to have a lot more time to make it. Matt from Engineering, like it, it's good. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, it's a, it's, it's a lot of work to do. Um, and it's not just a nine to five thing, like sometimes Ilya's there the whole filming session till he can't be there anymore. Um, more often than not, he's got something, some sort of engraving or something that he's gotta do. As soon as the camera's cut, he stays as late as he can. Uh, if I have like tricky grinding or a big giant grinding thing, I try to grind as much off camera as I can as well, just to save my back, um, spread it out as much as possible. Ference has always got a hard, lately we've, We've made him carve a lot more than he's probably used to, and 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 he can you know he can share some of that pressure because a lot of what he does is he carves something, then we make a mold of it, then we you know inject it with wax into that mold, get that that wax out and make a lost wax casting. If that casting doesn't work, or if it turns out crappy, we have to hand him that crappy casting and then he has to recarve it. So why don't you share a little bit about your struggles? Uh, my struggle. <laughs> or whatever it is you want to yeah, share. Yeah, yeah. You know, sometimes uh, uh, for me personally, it's um, it's 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 strange some of the builds and everything because we're we're working like Matt said, you know, on multiple builds and episodes all simultaneously. So I can carve some of the masterpieces in the beginning that we're going to go ahead and. Uh, put molds on so we can do the castings or whatnot. Uh, sometimes people ask me, why are you carving in this type of material? That's a big question I get. And a lot of times I want to work in a rigid material because if the, like Matt said, if, if the mold doesn't take or the casting doesn't take, I have a rigid master that's not going to get damaged and have to get remade again so we can do another mold. Uh, the other part, you know, and it's, it's a, there's a lot of hot potato. Uh, we're passing the pieces back and forth. We have limited time to do, get a little bit done on this, get it on film, pass it to one of the other guys so they can do what they need to do. Uh, a lot of times what happens, and, uh, and, and it's funny, um, we get there and I may not have a whole lot to do because my pieces were closer to the beginning of the build, but then near the end of the build, all of a sudden, Whoosh, I get four or five pieces on my table, you know, and it's like, like please make these runes on this blade, please. We don't have time to do it. <laughs> yeah. And that's another thing, you know, we might plan <clears throat> out as good as we possibly can, but when it gets to the end, who knows? Uh, I might stick him on a grinder and make him polish a blade or something. Who knows? Like, really, we all have to be able to do at least a little bit of everything because at the end, it's the most important things to get done. Are you about ready, sir? Soon. Soon. Very soon. All right. It's good. It's good. It's love life. One All of right. one of the advantages that that we have with that, like Matt's saying, you know, everybody has to be able to do a little bit because there's a lot of times when we all just need to jump in to just to be able to get it done, you know, whatever needs to be done, and. Uh, you know, it's a great thing because when that happens, a lot of times we get a chance to like really hands-on learn from each other in small detailed areas of different stuff like that, you know, that we're usually so busy of. Uh, usually when I get there, where they have me is pretty sequestered, which is normal for me. People usually put me in a corner anywhere I go. But I, a lot of times I don't even see the guys during the, uh, during the productions very much, you know, because we're all focused on working on our parts and interacting like this. And uh, so when we get a chance to, to do something that we wouldn't normally be doing like that just to jump in. It's a great learning experience <clears throat> from each other, and that's to me that's really valuable. Aww. It is, Aww. man. I love I you, man. I didn't know that. It's nice. Oh, that's very nice. 
All right. So um, I'm going to start the historical influence uh, panel slash presentation. Now, uh, if anybody's uncomfortable with uh, classic Greek sculpture and nudity, Penises. out. Penises. Uh, if people are not comfortable with uh, topics of theology and sexuality, out. That's it. Warren, giving, let's see, 10 seconds for people to gather up and leave. Uh, now everybody has consented to looking at some art. Um, fantastic. This is not it. Uh, <laughs> um, I just like the image. And, and like I said before, he, he'll, he'll talk forever. If you guys have questions about something he's saying, yeah, just, just please up. And we'll, we will raise, I mean, we'll leave 15 minutes or so at the end to talk about whatever it is that you feel like. Well. Okay. Uh, yeah. So the title of this is called Random Fantasy Image that I stole off of Google. If someone's the artist and knows the artist, I just don't care. I look for, I literally put in Google Random Fantasy Image. Uh, so in um, nowadays when we uh, see fantasy armor in video games, anime, so on and so forth, it looks somewhat like that. And uh, a segment of the population often gets upset, why is the armor sex sexualized? Why does the armor uh, depict uh, and exaggerate certain, certain features of the player's or NPC's body? Right, well, fair question. They argue that it's uh, impractical. Now, one thing we have to understand is that our idea of practicality is a product of our social historical situatedness. That is, uh, we are in the Anglophone world, in a region of that world that was founded by Protestants who were considered too conservative to reside in their own home country, so they were kicked out. And uh, Protestants have a funny history with England and funny history with the interpretation of scriptures. However, we also understand the topic of what is practical through a secular perspective. Uh, the way to really understand that is when you go to college and your parents say, well, is your degree practical? They mean, uh, is it going to be appreciated by the market forces? Is it necessary for society to operate? However, it was not always the case. Uh, the liberal arts in education included mathematics, literature, music, philosophy, astronomy, so on and so forth. And they were considered the same thing, part of the same facet. If we go early, I'm going to stand up. I hate uh, sitting when I talk. Uh, oh, boy. Uh, if we go early in time, um, one of the first uh, depictions of the human body in history is the Venice of uh, Wimbledorf. I will mispronounce it because English is not my first language, neither is German. Uh, everybody's familiar with the Venice of Wimbledorf, right? It's a fat lady with barely any head, but there's some curls there, right? Uh, the clay or stone sculpture. Now, the thing is, that sculpture is incredibly practical for the time when it was created. The reason is the people who lived all the way up until, let's say, 17th century did not separate theology and art from practicality. Matters of appeasing the gods were more practical than making shoes because the gods ruled heaven and they ruled earth and they ruled everything in between and underneath. So if you satisfy the river god by donating your firstborn son or secondborn daughter or what have you, that's more practical than having your child. Because the gods are there for almost forever, you're here for just a little bit. Consequently, portrayals of religious references on armor, on weapons, were more practical than the weapons themselves, in theory. That's why you have actually uh, crusaders having even Arabic prayers on their swords, and they placed them uh, on that, those swords because they saw, well, the Muslims are fighting fairly well, better than us, maybe their stuff works. It's as simple as that. Now, 
the usual uh, counter-argument to this sort of armor goes the following way. Well, uh, why are they showing boobs on female armor and not showing muscular chests on male armor? Why are they accenting certain parts of the body for women and not for men? Oh, I have stuff for you. Uh, boom, boom. My stuff is not in order, so uh, I'm terrible at this stuff. It's way boom, boom Greek armor. Uh, now, oh, and, and you even see the nipples, and this is, uh, you have abs, this is Arnold Schwarzenegger of uh, 2,300 years ago, right? Uh, and remember, this is Greek, this is bronze, so this would have been polished and looked like gold. Uh, armies dressed up in this would look like gods. Gods are de uh, described in Greek mythology as having gold skin and gold locks and... Uh, made out of precious materials, basically. So an army of those people would be incredibly intimidating attacking the enemy because they would have looked like gods. The idea of a hero uh, traditionally did not mean someone who does something nice for people. No, it literally means a product of a union between a mortal and an immortal is a hero. And consequently, in Legends, the hero does some things that mortals can't do. They, they're somewhat better than us. Hercules is one example. Achilles is another example, so on and so forth. Um, so this, at the same time, and this is Greece. Uh, they're very comfortable with their bodies, uh, much more so than we are. So this accents not only the claim to divinity of the warrior, it also accents their sexual virility. So, this is supposed to be sexy armor. Well, okay, but fantasy armor accents more than just the chest and the muscles. It accents a lot of unnecessary stuff. It would be the same as armor showing a man's beard. Boo! What? What? Really? Uh, now, this is a Phrygian helmet. Now, the funny thing is, uh, this helmet was worn by Alexander the Great's dad. So, that, that's a luxurious beard. We would think it's completely unnecessary to include the depiction of the beard in... This is a war helmet, this is not a parade helmet. You would actually fight in this. Uh, we would think it's completely unnecessary. However, it is as important to show your wealth, your erudition, and how, uh, and your sexual prowess as it is to have armor that defends uh, your body. Actually, the first two are more important than the latter because kings and noble people usually don't do the fighting. They uh, very often stay behind and pick up what's left. Uh, such is life, uh, yeah. Boom. Okay, so. Armor, generally, um, in all cultures, follows not only the uh, clothing fashion of the day, it also follows a certain uh, point where culture succeeded in its uh, art medium. In the Western world, uh, weapons and armor follow the sculptural tradition that goes from ancient Greece all the way to nowadays. Uh, in Japan or the world of Islam, it is usually either the paper tradition or the textile tradition. And it becomes blatantly obvious when you look at them. Um, so, this is uh, Kuros, uh, 530 BC. Uh, oh, the head is cut off, balls. Oh, you... Not that one. No? No, well, it, it doesn't matter. It's a little bit uh, stiff. There you go. Okay. So, 530 BC, uh, the sculpture is a little bit stiff. Uh, it's supposed to depict a water bearer uh, or uh, some assistant to a nobleman. Now, what we know, uh, they really cared about depicting a strong body. Now, they also cared a lot about depicting a strong naked body. Uh, funny enough, uh, it was very important to whoever commissioned that to show the beauty of the body and its ability to move in space. But they didn't quite figure out how to make a lifelike portrayal. Uh, about how many years later? 
same region of the world, of, yeah, about 100 years later. Uh, this is the Doriferous. Uh, this is, a, I think, a copy of the Doriferous, but nonetheless. Now we have the emergence of the contrapasta. Uh, people who know our history know the contrapasta is literally uh, contra, against, and pasta stance. So instead of standing like this, you kind of change the rotation of the torso and makes the sculpture dynamic. From now on, you can look at it not only straight on, but from the sides, and it's still engaging to the eye. Again, it's very important for the people who created that, and that's at about the same time as the armor that I showed you earlier was worn. Uh, a little bit early, actually. Uh, it's important to show the beauty of the body uh, and the fact, and he would actually hold a spear, so it's a warrior. Is the spear bearer. It's not just some dude carrying stuff. It looks like he wants the pinky swear. Uh, the, he would have had a bronze spear in his hand. The spear was lost. We don't know what it looked like. I blah, promise. blah. Now, this is a warrior. This is the depiction of a sexy warrior, a uh, young guy in Greece. A hand up. I actually can't see a lot of people because of the projectors. You have to so. go, ooh, ooh, ooh. He Those are. Uh, he said count to pasta, if, not, not eating pasta. Uh, <laughs> if you. Oh, who, who actually knows anything about the Olympics? You can interject anytime you want. Yes. Uh, what was one of the most uh, popular events amongst women? What? what, what, what who said race? Okay. Uh, what kind of race? No, no, no. Marathon ca comes out around l later. No. Men running naked with weapons. Now, uh, what do we? How do we know that that event was perniciously popular among women of the time? Yes. And why would people be prohibited from attending? No, because they actually do attend. See, the Olympics were to satisfy the gods. And uh, the, I think Spartans had a female Olympics that was slightly different. But the thing is, it was a religious practice. And gender roles are important for religious practices, especially of archaic religions that worship the gods of earth, the gods of time, the times of the year, and the gods of nature. Um, so. Women still attended those things. Uh, who remembers Monty Python, Life of Brian, where the selling of beards? That actually happened in Athens for that specific event. Yes, we have uh, graffiti of the time uh, depicting uh, women with beards and like, like jokes uh, about that stuff. So there's actually evidence of women tricking uh, people into attending those events because they wanted to look at naked men running around. Now, if you run around with armor, right, unlike modern gyms where people work out to look like, what is it, action figures, uh, actual, so to speak, practical, uh, running around with weapons develops different muscles. So these muscles are serious product of being an athlete. Clarence has some input on that too. Now, yeah. Yeah, on, on that note, uh, what you'll notice in, in, in artwork, and this is what part of what Ilya is showing the translation with uh, over time and into the, into the armor and the fantasy uh, characters and whatnot, is the emphasis on different parts of the body and different forms and proportions of the bodies. Uh, if you look back through a lot of art history, uh, and a, a real, real uh, easy example, if you look at Michelangelo Bernardi's David, uh, the proportions on that body are not particularly anatomically correct. Well, and I have a story a about that. that. <laughs> yeah, there's a reason for that. And that's to what he's saying now is to be able to emphasize these different things of the times of the cultures and what the characters and the portrayals were doing, what they're actually conveying by that muscular structures and the body proportions. Anyway, uh, yes. Uh, the other important thing is uh, this: uh, the young man depicted is also a sexual partner of an older military uh, general, so on and so forth, from what we know about Greek practices. So yes, th this, is, this is the image of a Greek warrior, right? It is even more nude than the fantasy armor I've shown before. 
like a, as nude as you can get. Uh, and it is supposed to be a sexual image. Now, comes around Rome, Rome collapses or dwindles away, comes around Christianity. The idea that a perfect human being is a combination of, so to speak, spiritual aspects as well as the fleshly ones goes away. And the image of a warrior becomes that of a pious man. Oh, you, see, you had your hand up for like 40 minutes already. That's wrong. That is wrong. Uh, do you know the relationship between Erastes and Eromenos? He's got big balls. So, um, the Erastes uh, is the dominant sexual partner, and Eromenos is the submissive sexual partner. And Eromenos was usually young, and the diminishing size of the genitalia would indicate youth. Yes, incredibly so. You see it in the great dialogues of Socrates. Uh, the actual only Greek thinker that stood up against that tradition was Aristotle because he considered it was abuse. I'm not talking about the, uh, the of the the yes, comrade. It, it was. That is what was considered to be attractive, a small size of a flaccid genitalia. Uh, there, there's a great article, I forgot who wrote about it, why the diminished size is actually the opposite of what we think. See, we are thinking about things in a 21st century <laughs> Anglophone post uh, <clears throat> Puritan tradition. So they thought about it completely differently. Uh, and a lot of scholars forget that. A lot of scholars engage in what is known as retrospective modernism, that is looking at ancient or medieval art with modern eyes and making conclusions from that instead of actually looking at the text. And that is not, the, if someone wanted to not look at the penis, they would not have sculpted it front and center. They would have placed something up. Oh, you can, uh, the medievals, when they try to imitate Greek art, would place a leaf over it. Oh, the Renaissance artists. Exactly. So, the Christians wanted to detract from the sexual aspect of it. The Greeks, it's, France, I forgot the article, I actually should have looked it up, why that is not the case, because it's a very common uh, thing people who study art history bring up, and it's wrong. Uh, it's, it's wrong uh, for basic reasons of what is considered fashionable in the Greek world. Um, because the only, okay, I don't want to deal on the penis that much, uh, but the only persons mm -hmm. who are actually shown with an enlarged genitalia in Greek art were the satyrs. And that was a sign not of uh, them being sexy, it was actually a sign that they can't control themselves. Uh, because satyrs are be bestial. Uh, the word bestiality actually means that you cannot control your passions to, so, to that point that you are like a beast. Uh, again, Aristotle. Uh, Aristotle's uh, Nicomachean Ethics. Um, okay, anyway, Christianity comes around uh, and the image of a warrior becomes attached to the archangels uh, and the saints. Uh, this is a Byzantine eleventh. Uh, yeah, this is a Byzantine eleventh century icon. Uh, the body is quite stiff, although they could and had the skills to make a realistic body. Uh, and the ideal of a warrior becomes the pious person. So the body is not important. If you look at medieval icons, pre-Renaissance uh, icons, all um, martyrs have a relatively peaceful expression on their faces, even when they're being tortured and slaughtered to death. It's only in the Renaissance that emotions and suffering starts being depicted. So, body's fully covered. Uh, the, the outlines of the body and the anatomy is actually being purposefully obscured 
by the radiance of the gold that is the radiance of the kingdom of heaven. Um, boom, boom, boom. Again, let me find you medieval art too. And that's, I'm gonna skip over medieval, uh, strictly medieval stuff as much as I can because it's a little bit boring. Again, this is uh, 13th century St. Maurice, um, what? I can't hear you. No penis. <laughs> no, it's not. It's a uh, brigandine. Uh, you see rivets? Yeah, uh, there are plates of metal riveted to the leather or thick fabric from underneath. <clears throat> and he's wearing it over chainmail. So again, the image uh, clearly in the design of the armor, it was not important to show what kind of athletic body a person had. What was important was to show piety. That was the primary feature of a Christian medieval warrior. Uh, this is done, this sculpture was done uh, 100 years after the First Crusade, uh, and the guy is black. Uh, the image of the black Saint Maurice becomes important because uh, quite a few Moors would be uh, would convert to Christianity during the Crusades and would come back to Europe. Not too many, but quite a few. Enough for it to become fashionable to accent a different race and ethnicity of a crusader to show that the Christian faith is so powerful that even foreign barbarians convert to Christianity and fight for the right cause. Again, even that part accents the piousness of the individual, not their athletic or military prowess. Oh, it's coming. But yes, it generally does. The clothing style of the day would hang relatively loosely like that. Uh, there's a theory why that was the case also because of the design of scissors. <clears throat> they would use shears that could not cut curves efficiently. So once we, they moved to scissors that actually pivot, they could start, the fashion designers could actually start cutting curves. Uh, I'm not sure how uh, central that part is, but it's certainly something to consider. And let's say 100 years later, again, uh, what comes around is a depiction of St. Michael. This is the beginning of the Renaissance. Around the same time, Giotto, um, starts painting. Wow, you already see the contrapposto emerging, a little bit still archaic looking, but you see the outlines of the body again becoming prominent. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Um, now, the, why does that happen? It is around the same time that low culture, perpetuated by the troubadours, who knows who the troubadours are? Go ahead, anyone. Yeah, troubadours. Yes. And what would they sing about? And what is included in those tales? Yes, the idea of courtly loves, love emerges. And the idea of, and that's why it's low culture, because the church doesn't like uh, Christian warriors uh, showing their underwear in public, basically. That's what it is, like who they sleep with. But it's incredibly engaging. Right? So it, it's only for so many hundred years you can listen to how pious uh, St. George was. And after a couple hundred years, people start, you know, like, tell me, like, did you fall in love? Uh, was he good in bed? <laughs> Come on, did his ass look good? Come on, just, just tell me that. Come on, give me the good stuff. Yeah, I know he was pious. Come on, just, just give me good stuff. And the troubadours pick up that uh, human necessity to know more about the person. Renaissance starts around the same time, so high culture, the rediscovery of Greek myths and Greek philosophy and Greek poetry comes around. Strikes with a vengeance. All of a sudden, even the Pope wants to know that stuff. Now, the thing is, the Greek thought stressed that it's not enough to be pious. You have to develop yourself as a mortal body in the world. So, it is, what's wrong is not being promiscuous. What's wrong is being promiscuous to the point where 
you're not a balanced person. So that idea slowly starts trickling into art and armor design that you have to show a little bit of your body, a little bit of the figure, and that that's impressive to others. Now, uh, boom, boom, boom. It's like skin, Let's, skinny jeans kind of thing? Yeah, kind of thing. Yeah. Well, you have to show your thighs. Never skip a leg day. <laughs> he teases me about that constantly. I do. Okay, <clears throat> this is a 15th century Gothic suit of armor. Perhaps the, you can, can you see well? Okay, now, oh, who did the fashion thing question? Okay, that guy over there. The shoes, uh, those shoes were actually in fashion. Uh, this imitates, so this imitates tight leggings. Uh, shoes, those are called hose, by the way. Uh, the stockings that are at the same time your footwear are called hose. Uh, now, it, it requires tremendous skill and knowledge of anatomy to make armor that almost like a wetsuit replicates the shape of the body. Like, it notice that a study of anatomy was an illegal thing for up until the 17th century. Leonardo da Vinci almost went to prison for studying anatomy. Fortunately enough, one of the buddies who was wrapped up in that police raid, so to speak, was the son of a very wealthy individual, so they all got off. But we almost went to prison for that. Now, the Gothic flute, stop. You see the uh, fluting on the elbow that char characterizes Gothic armor? The thing is, uh, it's, it's not obvious until you see it. Those imitate the folds of your clothing, the wrinkles. The pleats. Now, you see the wasted line, the hourglass shape? Now, you see, right now, in modern times, we interpret that as uh, the female ideal form. It used to be the male fo ideal form for a long, 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 long time. Long time. Before the English language sounded like the, Eng like the English language we speak now, and for longer than the English language sounded like the English language we speak now. This has been the ideal. Now, this uh, imitates a jupon. Uh, that is the type of clothing you wear. Got it court. also accents the fact that the guy is not fat. Very good to know. Uh, the armor accents the broad shoulders, also very important. Uh, go down on the legs. Show me some leg. Again, if you actually in person look at it around and imagine the body, because this replicates the body almost exactly. Uh, it, th there's, there's, you can't, shouldn't be able to slide a piece of paper between the armor and the body. Because that's, it actually moves better that way. Uh, hey. This is supposed to show that the guy is well built. Not only is he rich to afford this, he is well built. He is sexy. For like, and the one evidence, I can show you additional reason for the argument is where is that thing that people focus on? Is that it? Yeah, this kind of thing. Yeah. It's very yeah. So, um, now, Go back. one thing. That's how the troubadour um, tradition, as well as the beginning of the Renaissance, influenced armor. Theology is still important. What is theologically correct is as practical as eating, because no one at the time believed that maybe there is no God. Not a single person. Not a single person ever questioned the fact that angels are watching them. It, it was not even a question. Uh, any uh, argument in theology starting out about existence of God are actually written as confessionals, and they start out, the fool said in the depth of his heart to question God. So it's always the fool, it's always a confession, so it's not an equal argument in standard argument form. It's written as a poetic confession. Now, um, got a question in the back. Go, uh, I, go on.
No. Fashion. Well, you said what the point? Um, no, it's pure imitation of fashion. Uh, the, the reason is, first of all, uh, that suit of armor would have been incredibly expensive at the time. Incredible, uh, equivalent of several millions of dollars just to put on. So the whole point of buying such an expensive piece of armor that protects about the same as the cheap piece of armor is to show off how wealthy you are. By that time, already some knights were more wealthy than some kings. In fact, a little bit earlier than that suit of armor, about 100 years, in 370, uh, 1314, uh, the Knight Templars were all burned at the stake. Why? Yes, too much money, but why exactly was it considered too much? Because the King Philip was in debt to them. And when the king, the anoint, the, the king is the guy who has the mandate of heaven to rule. When the king owes money to regular knights, some of whom started out poor, it's indecent. So just kill him. Easy. So, uh, was already a problem then. So, by the time that armor exists, it was as practically important to show how much wealthier you are than the opponent as it is to actually be protected. In fact, it was more important. Again, wealthy people don't do most of the fighting. Conscripts do fighting, peasants do fighting when they're recruited for war. Regular soldiers do fighting, maybe poor knights do fighting. Kings don't. Dukes don't. Uh, they pick up what's left. Now, a little bit later, boom, boom, boom. Uh, it's going to, oh, by the way, the back of this, this should be more obvious. Can you? Yeah. All right, look at the folds, look at the flutes along the back. Uh, it becomes more obvious that this imitates uh, some sort of clothing. Because when you do pleated clothing, the pleats would lay just like that. Um, all right, so, boom. Again, uh, now we go on to King Maximilian, whom is hilarious. All right, now. This is known as Maximilian Armour, the self-proclaimed emperor of uh, Germany, Maximilian, said to have designed this armor. Now, you see the bulbous chest uh, that reflects the clothing of the time. Again, see, we see the narrow waistline, important. Um, Try it. <laughs> so, now, let's go up and look at his helmet. This guy in the back is really happy. Look at him. <laughs> he wasn't smiling until he did that. So, um, the reason why, and, and this is incredibly excessive and hard to execute, especially with traditional material. I don't know. Can't get especially with traditional material, uh, because it delaminates and all that stuff. But, it shows how wealthy you are. It's also obnoxious, because this is tournament armor. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move. You're going to move? I'm not doing anything to you. Um, this is tournament armor, so a helmet like that would be worn as a joke to irritate your opponent when they show up to a tournament. And remember, it's only very wealthy people participating in the tournament. So when you prepare, you put all that gold, all that stuff that shows how regal you are, and try like, oh, I'm going to beat that guy, and the guy shows up as the Monopoly guy, it's just, <laughs> it's, not, it's not the same, it's just not the same. Okay, now, here's, here's why it is a joke. And we know that helmets like that were a joke. The story between King Henry VIII and Emperor Maximilian is a bromance 
sort of thing. Now, I, I usually show this as an example why theology take and the pious warrior go recedes as the image of the night, and a human being with a sense of uh, with humor, with uh, a sense of uh, self-criticism and a sense of criticism of others comes to the forefront. This helmet was a gift to King Henry from King Maximilian. King Henry, when he was growing up as a boy, was not allowed to do any warrior stuff, nothing. Not allowed to ride a horse, not allowed to joust, but he really wanted to. Uh, English armor at the time sucked compared to the continental stuff. Just, they, they were centuries behind. Uh, so, when King Henry became the king, he developed a great friendship with uh, Emperor Maximilian. Maximilian sends the, him this as a gift, knowing that King Henry's armor is blow, uh, that King Henry always wanted a nice suit of armor but couldn't acquire one because his armor is blow and his dad didn't allow him to get one. And you know what this helmet is? No. Kind of, but no. No. Yeah, but what kind? Grotesque. Kind of. How? This is a caricature of Emperor Maximilian himself. A hook nose, making fun of bedside, making fun of buck teeth, all that stuff. This is, Emperor Maximilian commissions a caricature of himself as a gift for another king, King Henry, to wear at the tournament. So the nicest piece of armor at the tournament hosted by Emperor Maximilian that another king could get was a caricature of the host of the party. This is the nicest thing a king could get. It blows. It's like uh, for people who are in high school showing up to the prom in a cheap version of the prom queen's dress. It, it just blows. And it's the nicest thing uh, Henry could get. Uh, we know of that because there's a fit, like correspondence about it. It's in the ledgers. Most of the rest of the armor is lost, so we don't know what it looks like. If you actually look up close, there's uh, etched stubble, lack of shaving on the helmet too, so it's a complete joke. Now, so the relationship between knights um, as a group and the peasant was the following. Even this would be polished bright, so a less caricaturistic suit of armor when it passes by some village would look like Archangel Michael stepping down from heavens, glistening in the sun, because all the peasants are pooping in the street and everything's covered with mud. Um, they would also be, appear sexy because their armor replicates the trends of fashion, and fashion is really always about showing off, it always is. Whatever counts as showing off, that's what fashion is about. Uh, that's the relationship between the peasants and the knights. The relationship between knights and knights and knights and kings is more like Mean Girls than uh, Game of Thrones. Uh, it's, it's that level. Uh, yes, they backstab each other, but mostly they buy stuff that's more expensive than the next guys to make them feel bad. To the point that tournaments and around the 16th century develop rules that people who are not of royal blood are not allowed to have gold on their shit. Why? Well, because people of not royal blood end up having more gold on their stuff than people of royal blood. And the whole point of royalty is that heaven gave you the right to rule, maybe, possibly, if you don't get killed, but still. And all of a sudden, you're forced to tolerate such treatment? Oh no, we can't have that. Now, all right, so, comes in, what, what is this? What are you showing me? Oh, I have, to, uh, it's good. Uh, yeah, I know. Are we going to have a, any like general questions at the end? There are a lot of people want to know certain things. Uh -uh. Oh, he was ecstatic, sort of. <laughs> now, okay. This is um, Rubens' copy of Leonardo da Vinci's Lost Painting. Uh, everybody's familiar with Leonardo da Vinci. I mentioned him, right? Everybody familiar with Rubens? Out. 
Rubens. Peter Rubens. Okay, excellent. So the armor portrayed here is complete fantasy, right? And we think, oh, it's only the painting. No one actually had that armor. Oh, well, this, is, this doesn't count, blah, blah, blah. No, yeah, it does count because comes in Filippo Negroli and makes stuff like that, right? It, it's almost exactly. He, the armors during the Renaissance or the end of the Renaissance were in constant correspondence with people like Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, so on and so forth. They would write to each other because they became, after a while, the fashion designers of the day. Uh, it's, uh, you know, the, you think the Dolce Gabbana people don't talk to, you know, uh, pop stars and all that, so you, they, they talk to each other. So, yes, this is Filippo Negroli. Now, this is cosplay at the same time. At around um, that time when this was made, there was a bestseller uh, describing a fictionalized version of the Crusades where Mr. Romanzo is pursuing his love. And the Moors, the Muslims, were depicted as wearing dragon skin and uh, that, basically. So it was fantasy of the time. And almost, if you're anybody in the world, you had to have read it because otherwise they'll make fun of you. It's like not watching the latest blah, blah, blah movie. So armor like that was commissioned. Um, Islamic armor never looked anything close to that. So this is Filippo Negroli. Again, a little bit of Negroli too because we're, uh, the Greeks are still important, remember, right? So dressing up as Alexander the Great's dad is pretty cool. Again, this is a fairly realistic because if you look at it up close, Almost every single hair is chased in. The beard is covered golden. So again, it, and this was worn by someone to a tournament. So the, the whole unnecessary armor part thing is still there. And beards were considered sexy at the time in certain regions of Europe. They just were. Um, I'm trying to rush through this, but. Ah, bleh. <laughs> uh, boom, boom, boom. Do we have another Negro? Yep. This is another version of this. More than one of them? Mm -mm. Yeah, you can. No. He, did you say did he or could you? Mm -mm. Uh, he made a whole bunch of helmets, not the same one, but they were fairly similar. What did I want to show? It was here and I lost it. You know, we're just going to op open it for questioning and if a relevant image comes up, I'll just pull it up. Isn't she still wearing a miniskirt, right? Yeah. yeah. They forgot one thing. Amazons would cut off their right breast. They forgot to do that. They have like a plate there. They do. Uh, they, 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 they hinted towards it. Yeah, they, uh, the Japanese have a piece of armor that pushes the armor and the breast down on one side. They didn't decide to cut off breasts. And the reason why breasts would be cut off is the same reason Japanese put this part down is because in those cultures, the nobleman's weapon would be a bow. In Europe, in medieval Europe, it would actually be the peasant's weapon, the bow. So. Yellow hat, you already had a question. He had two. What? See what you did there? Well, not dollars, but equivalent. It's like a Ferrari. High-end armor. So how much of that stuff was made? How durable was it? Baby, mercy. You said it wasn't right? Well, the stuff that is in museums was used once. That's mine. Uh, because it's preserved because it wasn't used. But in Europe, 
in certain places, medieval armor comes out of the ground as if it's dirt. It's just so Europe has been fighting itself for three, oh, well, 2,000 years straight on. So there's a lot of crap armor in the ground, just a lot. Next question, right here, you. Which one? I'm pointing something. <gasps> Oh. I beg you mercy. Oh, that is a yeah. Arab depiction of the devil. Uh, so at the time, why people would make horrible and ugly armor was at around the same time in both Europe and the Islamic world, as well as in Japan, a art form of depicting the horrible starts being uh, developed to its fullest extent. The progenitor of this is, in a sense, uh, Chinese art, BC art, the uh, motif called Tao Tie. Does anybody know it? Mm -mm. It's one of the four demonic beasts in Chinese mythology. It's usually portrayed as a symmetric uh, mask uh, that is devouring something. It is called an apotropic motif. Apotropic means, means horror-inducing. And hence the dragon armor uh, by Negroli, too. It's supposed to be apotropic. Long hair. That narrows it down. a lot of money, but like. Not all. How much would a, a suit of armor be, like, relative terms to how much would we need to spend? Well, the Gothic suit would be a couple million dollars equivalent. Uh, there are cases of um, princes being captured bought out by their family for ransom, but the enemies would keep their armor, and then the prince would give cast a castle or some land or a lot of money to buy the armor back because there's so much money tied up in the armor. Uh, you are talking the pre-medieval Eastern Roman Empire. Byzant no, no, no. Uh, there's no Roman Empire early medieval unless you count as Russia because they called themselves the Roman Empire after for no reason whatsoever. Uh, what happens is Byzantium uh, maintained Roman armor uh, as its foundation and just basically Persianized it. All right, one more question. I see you hand pumping in the back to the left. How about that one? You. Yep. Yep, you. Uh, oh. uh, the Louvre, uh, the Hermitage, there's uh, a great museum in France called uh, Les Invalides, uh, the Invalids. Um, then a whole bunch of museums in Germany. Uh, there are museums all across Europe that each one of them probably has one or two suits. Uh, the Negroli piece is actually in Washington, D.C., one of them, in the Museum of Natural History, right? Something like that. The helmet. Yeah, you can see the Negroli uh, dolphin helmet, not this one, the other one. Oh, yeah, right up front. Yep. Well, I mean, we got one minute left, so basically I just want to say thank you guys for coming out to both our panels, if you came to both of them. Just one, that's okay too, I suppose. Um, this is, yes, this was a man arms panel, but this is pretty much all Ilya, so make I get sure, to show education. Yeah. Make sure you give him a follow on Instagram, Slav Life. Slavic Smith. Slavic Smith, Slav Life. And uh, yeah, I stream on Twitch, Stalker Tron on Twitch, if you wanna hit me up. You got anything you wanna plug, yeah, sir? Yeah, you, uh, you can follow me on Instagram, Sobra Studio on Instagram, and uh, you can also follow us all on Facebook. You're gonna need to spell that, sir. Thanks for coming out. Starbraz. Yeah, if you guys have questions that we don't get to, if you can't make it down to the booth, if we're not there or something, make sure you join the Man at Arms Facebook group. Not just the, like, all me page, but the Facebook group. We actually run that. Our moderator's here. Um, so he, he keeps track of stuff. We try to keep, like, the, hey, will you please make this kind of stuff off there and more of the, like, 
why'd you do it this way? Or questions kind of like pertaining to like this panel, like questions, you know, historical techniques, stuff like that, it's cool stuff like that. And uh, yeah, I really appreciate you guys having us out. And yeah, see you next year. Katsukon, that next something.